Welcome everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce our, our distinguished speaker today, Chung Young. Uh, Chung and I go back many years. In fact, uh, I've known him since I was a graduate student. We wrote our first paper together before we actually ever met him. Uh, and uh, you know, over the years, he's, he's moved around quite a few different places. So uh, I think he got his PhD from the University of Maryland, then he went to University of Waterloo, spent some time there as a faculty member, then went to Simon Fraser, and then to the University um, H A U S T, uh, where he became chair of the department. He's on leave now, currently uh, heading up uh, AI for a uh, small company. So, but John's done quite a bit of really interesting work over the years. I knew him early on for his work on planning, but he's moved on to other things like natural learning, machine learning, uh, variety there. Anyway, he's done a lot of really interesting work, so I'm really pleased that he's going to tell us about you know what he's been thinking about lately in terms of. Uh, uh, privacy and data silos and AI. So uh, please welcome John. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, it's a, it's really a, a great pleasure to be here. I, I remember the last time I gave a talk here was in 1997, and and uh, uh, visited here. I had a tour around. Also, Yolanda was here. Uh, so that was like yesterday. Yeah, that that's when oh, I was oh, in, oh, in okay. Vancouver. <laughs> 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 okay. I, I remember distinctly uh, in that year, the movie uh, Titanic came out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is my title. And uh, let me just give you a, a brief overview of, of my, my motivation. Um, so we all know that AI today uh, are joined, uh, AI is enjoying uh, uh, exciting growth. Uh, but the, the growth is motivated partly by big data. So, so the uh, the chart on, on the right shows the more data you have, the better the performance, and, and that's uh, I think everybody agrees. Um, but the question is where to get the data. So, so this is my where my research is currently focused on. Uh, first of all, when we work in practice, we feel that there are uh, mostly small data, not necessarily big data. So by big data, we mean tens of millions of labeled examples like in, uh, image net. Uh, but in uh, many applications, we, we don't have this luxury. Uh, the second problem is our data are usually fragmented in silos, uh, in different departments, in different organizations, different hospitals. And so it's, it's not so easy to integrate them. Uh, so that's why I'm working on these two things. One is called transfer learning and another is called federated learning. Um, so to uh, back me up, there are some uh, facts. There are many facts uh, about small data. So for example, in legal practice, people are collecting these uh, uh, legal cases as training examples for machine learning but they can quickly find that uh, completed and, and good cases are very uh, hard to come by. Uh, and so at most you can collect about 10,000 to 20,000 of them, hardly enough for training a, a good uh, a deep learning system. In finance, it's, uh, it's the same situation. Uh, in very large loan, um, the good examples are uh, very, very far, uh, uh, Scarce. And in medical, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, medical imaging hospitals usually they come in thousands rather than millions of, of uh, labeled examples. So therefore, we uh, try to look at transfer learning, um, and, and that's the Chinese for transfer learning. Uh, <laughs> you can guess. Um, so we take uh, from human uh, uh, example. Uh, so after we learn. The, um, uh, how to um, ride bicycle, we, we can uh, more quickly learn how to ride a motorcycle. And the reason is because uh, uh, there are many features that are common between the two domains. So likewise, in machine learning, we try to do the same thing. And here we have um, an existing domain in blue and a new domain in red. And when we try to transfer, uh, we have several um, opportunities we can transfer through the, the source uh, to the target data 
uh, we can we can transfer some samples, we can transfer part of the model, or we can transfer part of the task. Um, now, so but the the wisdom uh, that uh, people have uh, learned throughout uh, recent years in uh, transfer learning practice is that if the source domain is very extensive in terms of the data size, then it's more likely to succeed when we transfer to different small data. And, and so here are some examples. Uh, first of all, when we, when we try to transfer between models here from top down, from the source domain to the target domain, uh, there are opportunities when, when we deal with um, a structured model, such as a deep learning system. We can look at the, the model by layers. Uh, the input comes from the left, so it's, it's the lower layer. Uh, when we look at the lower layer, um, uh, in image domain at least, it's easier to transfer uh, than uh, the top layer, because the top layers are closer to the task at hand. And usually different domains distinguish uh, differ in the tasks, but not so much um, differ uh, in the lower uh, level representation. Um, so as, as such, we can formulate some kind of a transfer learning strategy by um, looking at the horizontal axis here are uh, the layers from the first layer to the seventh layer uh, corresponding to the uh, uh, deep learning uh, uh, hierarchies. And the vertical axis corresponds to the effect of transfer. So the, the yellow line here shows that as we move higher and higher, each individual level uh, have different effectiveness and, and that decreases with the layer. And so uh, it's much easier to transfer when, when you are at the, the lower levels. And so we can use this um, as a uh, simulated annealing strategy when we, um, when we uh, structure the, the transfer learning uh, from top down. We can allow most of the uh, layers at the bottom to be transferred to um, the target domain. But for top levels, we, um, we only transfer a little bit. And, and, and the higher we go, uh, the fewer we, we uh, allow uh, knowledge to transfer. And that will result in the green line, which makes the, the transferring more, more successful as we uh, go along. So this is, uh, this is the general intuition we have about transfer learning. Um, and in terms of the domains, we can uh, grossly classify in two categories. One is when we have uh, no labeled data in the target domain. And so we, are, uh, uh, we have a source domain model and we want to transfer uh, that model to uh, uh, as much as possible, even when we don't have a labeled example in, in the target domain. The second one is we have some labeled example and, and we want to capitalize on that. So let's look at the first setting, and this is usually called domain adaptation. It is when we, we uh, so this is often used in natural language processing. Um, so here I use an example in sentiment analysis, where uh, the goal is to classify this text into um, positive or, or negative uh, orientation. Um, and the usual way to do this is to uh, look at it as, as a um, text classification problem. Uh, and usually we can trace back to some sentiment words in the text which uh, are representative of positive or negative orientation. Uh, but here we are interested in cross-domain sentiment analysis and the source domain may have a lot of labels and we can build a good uh, classifier. But in the target domain, we have no label. Um, and so the question is how, how we can do this. Um, now, of course, a, a way to do this is to, to find out the correspondence or mapping between the keywords. And here the keywords are circled. And some keywords, such as the, the ones on the right, are domain dependent, such as the word glossy or representative, because 
in the electronics domain, they mean um, positive sentiment. Um, but how do we know that thoughtful and glossy should correspond to each other? Well, the, the key here is to use um, domain independent sentiment words as a bridge or pivots um, so that we can correlate between the domain dependent sentiment words and domain independent ones and use them to, to do the transfer as a bridge. Um, so about 10 years ago, there, there had been work in this area, one is called structural correspondence learning, which allows these words um, um, marked in blue and, and red respectively to, um, to be clustered in corresponding clusters. So, so uh, when, they, when they could mean the same thing in their respective domains. Um, so the idea is to find out these uh, correspondence uh, via the pivot words. Uh, and the pivot words here are engaging and thoughtful um, and, and so it means good, okay? Um, now, how do we do, how do we find out these pivot words that are domain independent, uh, such as the, the word good? Um, that are number one uh, independent of the domain, right? So they can they can be uh, they can be a bridge between the two domains. And number two, they are very representative of the sentiment, such as good and bad. How do we find them out automatically? Uh, well, so this is our new work just uh, appeared recently, and uh, the idea is to split a uh, the model in two parts. Uh, the left part is an attention model which focuses on the source domain. Um, and so that part is in charge of increasing the classification accuracy as much as possible by identifying the uh, domain independent pivot words. Um, now, sometimes we, we, we make mistake and the words we pick are domain dependent. And so this is to, uh, to filter them out is the task of the right-hand side model, which um, is a domain classification model. Based on the keywords found on the left, we want to use these keywords to classify the two domains. If we cannot tell the difference between uh, the source and target domain, then it means these words are neutral. Okay, so they satisfy uh, the pivot definition. Um, so the left model aims to maximize the classification accuracy and the right uh, half model aims to minimize the classification accuracy. And so if you find out the words uh, that satisfy this, then uh, these words such as great can be found out and, and pivot. Um, and so here are some performance analysis which show that we can indeed uh, find out these pivot words automatically and they make sense uh, when we inspect them. So this is one example of how transfer learning is, is done when, when we, we have no label data in the target domain. Uh, a second example is, is here. When um, a, a Stanford uh, geology uh, team worked with World Bank in classifying satellite images in order to figure out the economic situation in Africa, uh, in order to determine their aid policy and, and so on. Um, but if we take the right-hand side photo, it's only a, a two-dimensional uh, colored photo. It doesn't give us any indication on the economic situation. Uh, so the key here is to, to use transfer learning to help uh, first classify according to night images because the light uh, is a first indicator of economic uh, wealth. And, um, and so the, um, the, the first transfer occurs between image net, uh, the label images there, uh, and, and the transfer is to the night images, which gives, gives us a regression model which can uh, give a rough approximation to, to this uh, uh, 
uh, classification based on light. And the second stage transfer occurs between the night image and the day image, uh, which can find out more features such as schools and bridges and highways, which are um, extra indicators of economic growth. Um, so combining these together, uh, they report that their uh, two-stage transfer uh, works very well. Um, and uh, as compared to the uh, uh, field study. Uh, so this corresponds to a transitive transfer, uh, which uh, allows transfer learning to occur in a succession. Okay. Uh, and in finance, uh, transfer learning has also been successfully applied. Here the situation is um, a bank tries to come up with a credit rating model for large loans. And so here you want to uh, build a uh, embedding for, for the applicant, uh, embedding for, for the subject of the, uh, the loan. Um, and, and many situations such as, um, you know, the, the, the size of the loan prevents uh, the loan to occur very frequent. So maybe in the year, the number of good cases is in the hundreds rather than in the millions. Uh, hardly enough to build a, a good picture um, of uh, uh, the application. Um, so um, these people apply transfer learning from small loan micro accounts, which uh, can happen quite a lot, like credit card uh, loans uh, can occur in the order of 100 million. And so this model is very stable and robust. And the transfer learning happens between the micro loans and the large loans. Um, so the result is a robust model which can um, help the uh, um, increase the um, profit for, for, the, uh, for the bank. Uh, the second situation is uh, when we have some supervision in the target domain. And this, super, this is applied to the dialogue system. Um, so suppose we have set up a dialogue system on the left for um, automated agent to, um, to help customers buy coffee. Um, and so and this uh, is a big business in China, is to order coffee and, and be deli delivered um, uh, uh, using uh, uh, the delivery service. Um, so um, when you have a very stable uh, conversational system, how do you uh, change the coffee ordering from one domain to another, say from coffee to tea, or from a group of people to another group of people? Um, so um, in the end, this model can be modeled as a reinforcement learning um, algorithm, which takes uh, the conversation, goes through a succession of states, uh, the, the goal state is where the coffee is successfully served and all the information gathered. Um, but for different users, they may choose to go through different sequence of states, different paths in the search space. Um, and a shorter search space corresponds to a, a more personalized um, conversation. Uh, and, and that can be done through transfer learning. Okay. So we can transfer from a general uh, policy uh, of going from the initial state to the end state to a specialized policy, which uh, includes more personalized preferences. And, and the result shows that in, in the field test, um, which involve about 50 source users and 20 target users, the result shows um, promising um, uh, progress. Um, the same situation occurs in online recommendation on the mobile phone. Um, and, and on the right here is a, a sequence of news uh, articles recommended in a personalized way to, to each user. And this, uh, the engine behind is a reinforcement learning which, uh, algorithm which balances between exploration and exploitation. Um, and so this policy, once learned, 
uh, it's a general policy and, and it's a very precious uh, knowledge. Um, but when we want to um, when we want to specialize for for person for for individual person, uh, we have to instantiate this general policy for uh, 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 E and E to a specialized user uh, using some uh, additional information. And so this corresponds to cross-domain recommender systems. Um, and using this uh, uh, transfer learning, uh, it, we, we, we get some really good results. So the result is reported in AAA 18 uh, under the title of Transferable Contextual Bandit, which is using transfer learning in a bandit algorithm, which is um, also uh, takes information from context. Um, in the end, um, we see some very promising moves uh, in the field. Um, and so, as, as I mentioned very early on, uh, transfer learning tends to be very successful uh, when the source domain gets uh, a lot of data and have wide coverage. And this is the case when um, this group of people from Facebook um, uh, try to extend the image net data from 10 million uh, to uh, 100 million. Um, and when the data is ex uh, extended um, uh, uh, to uh, the very large size, uh, the vertical axis shows the result of transfer learning when we have only a few examples in the target domain. And you can see that the performance increases to almost um, training the, the model uh, with all the data. Okay, so, so transfer learning really improves when we increase the size of the source data. The same situation also is confirmed in natural language processing uh, with uh, the arrival of BERT and the successors of BERT uh, with the increase of, of uh, uh, training data the accuracy of uh, uh, specializing in any specific natural language processing domain uh, getting much easier uh, as well. Now, if we engage in this kind of uh, learning from very large domain to a lot of specialized tasks, over time, we may gain a lot of uh, uh, data about transfer learning. So the data about transfer learning is one, so for example, when we look at the, the timeline on the uh, horizontal axis, we can see one domain after another. And at any time point, we may have a, a large number of domains in our library we have already accumulated. Now, so the next transfer learning uh, experience can benefit from all previous experiences. So if we take this experience if you record how the transfer learning works and how the domain is represented, we can uh, use transfer learning, we, we can use machine learning to learn about transfer learning. So, um, so for the next task, we can find it easier to find a, a, a better transfer learning algorithm, a better setting for parameters. So this is our work, uh, so transfer learning, the uh, learning to transfer and it's reported in SAML. Uh, so this is, uh, it, it's, the idea is closer to AutoML, uh, so automatically doing transfer. Um, so here are some results uh, on, on the right. So it's uh, the automatic uh, transfer learning uh, process is very similar to a search for a optimal point in a hyperspace, uh, so so the problem can be formulated formally and uh, yeah, optimization. Um, so some of these work are summarized in our recent book, which is about to appear. Uh, it's titled Transfer Learning, and, and here on the left is a picture of food at MIPS, uh, which is occurring now. Okay, um, so that was the first problem uh, we are tackling. Uh, which is the small data problem. The second problem we try to tackle is the data fragmentation problem where each data set is in silos, so it's, it's not communicating with others due to a number of reasons. 
Um, the, there are many reasons, but recently everybody is aware of the regulation, uh, such as uh, you know the, the case with uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and so on, and the European um, law which came out in May last year, uh, which makes data sharing between parties uh, difficult, impossible, sometimes illegal or immoral. So people are getting more and more uh, timid with uh, sharing data. Um, so this actually poses a problem, a challenge for machine learning because uh, on one hand, we wish to get as much data as possible, uh, not just samples, but also features, right? So we, we want data from different angles uh, about the same patient, for example, from different labs and hospitals. Um, so we don't really get the picture on the left. Uh, more uh, situations are like on the right where we have these silos of data. Um, so how, how do we deal with this? In fact, in China, the situation is getting more serious uh, to the point that the national laws are, are coming out and uh, a lot of uh, illegal dealings are dealt in court and some CEOs are in jail. Um, so uh, even within big companies like Tencent and Baidu, different departments are um, not exchanging data. And so, so they, they themselves find they are strangled in a way. So, so the question is, do we have any technical solutions for this? Um, is it possible for us to um, allow different enterprises to work together? So here's a simple view of two enterprises who wish to work together. Uh, the enterprise B has uh, two parts of the data. One is the, the data features. Um, another is uh, which are called X2. Um, and another part is the labels, which are very valuable and and private, um, and, and that's called Y. Now, maybe you have another enterprise uh, which has additional information on these users in X2, and, and that's called X1. And so the, the wall prevents them from integrating the data in a very um, rough and na naive way. Okay, so, so what should we do? Well, in fact, the uh, privacy-preserving mathematics uh, has been progressing uh, quite a lot in recent years under the d different names like secure multi-party computation, uh, homomorphic encryption, um, uh, garbled circuit, uh, secret sharing, and, and so on. Some of these won Turing Award like uh, uh, Yale's garbled circuit very early, early on in, in 1980s. Differential privacy is also a very widely accepted technology in the academic world. Um, so some of these can help to design a distributed machine learning that is secure. Um, so what we wish to do in, um, in this case is to allow different parties to work in a uh, uh, normal way uh, in building a, a, a collective model together but the data do not have to travel uh, beyond their lo lo local uh, sites. Uh, so our strict um, requirement constraint is that uh, no data travels outside their local parameter uh, while the, uh, the model is being built uh, among these parties. Uh, that turns out to be uh, quite a lot of people are working on this. Uh, such as this uh, secure um, uh, ML uh, using uh, some computation using the Oscarbo circuit. Um, uh, now, it turns out uh, one very promising technology is homomorphic encryption, which put it simply uh, is to uh, allow encryption to be distributed uh, between the elements. Uh, so if we have a addition U plus V, we can distribute the uh, encryption um, among U and V separately. Uh, and the result is, um, is uh, performed on their encryption. 
Um, similarly for scalar multiplication. So this basically allows us to encrypt a com complicated formula and send the encryption to another party. And the other party without knowing the content of U and V, uh, that is the data, uh, can perform some update on their model um, under the wrap of encryption without breaking the wrap and then send the result back. Um, so this allows secret to be kept while operations to be performed. Okay, so, so that is good. So sometimes we, we are not so lucky as to have these uh, polynomial formulas. So um, we have trouble applying homomorphic encryption. In that case, we can use Taylor series to, to do the expansion, like in this logistic uh, formula, which allows a um, piecewise linear approximation to the uh, uh, logistic function. So this can be done. Um, and sometimes uh, homomorphic encryption is not enough to prevent leaking of information between two parties. Like this, um, if two parties are collectively building uh, a, a image classifier, such as for this uh, letter O, then what happens is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, by looking at the transaction record, uh, one party can second guess the data from the other party, can, can still, um, if you have multiple transmission of parameters. So this tells us that we not only have to um, encrypt, um, not only um, uh, disallow data to travel out, we have to encrypt the parameters as well. And we have to ensure that the parameters uh, when arriving in a, a session, that all the data in that session do not reveal the data or the parameter of the other uh, model of the other party. Okay, so this gives us uh, two frameworks for, um, for uh, machine learning under the security. And this is known as federated machine learning or federated learning in short. And there are two categories. One is to uh, consider the data um, uh, from A and B have some overlap, and the overlap is um, is on, on the features. So vertically are features, um, and horizontally are displayed are samples or users. And this is the situation when uh, we have a, um, a mobile phone company uh, with a server serving multiple phones. Each phone, um, uh, different phones may share features, right? Um, but uh, each phone holds different samples, uh, and that's called horizontal. A vertical is more like uh, when two banks work together, and they share uh, a lot of users or two hospitals, um, but the features do, do not share. Uh, so this is the, the vertical situation. Uh, so the horizontal is more like to see to consumer, and the vertical is like to business. So in the horizontal, um, the data are separated in different silos, and the division is by users. Um, but these different silos uh, have large overlaps over, over features. In, in this case, we can allow the two parties to work together in, uh, um, in a federated learning manner by wrapping each other's uh, parameters, such as uh, loss and graded information under uh, homomorphic encryption and send to the other to uh, engage in the next round of update. So we can, we can design algorithms such as logistic regression, um, uh, deep learning use, using back propagation, uh, and uh, decision forest. Uh, so all these popular have been designed in one way or another. Um, now, in fact, um, Google was the first to apply this in the real-world situation in, in a paper in 2018 on their uh, mobile keyboard prediction problem known, known as Gboard um, between different parties. So this is the Gboard uh, uh, framework, where uh, in step A on the left, 
a phone uh, gets extra data. Uh, so instead of sending the data to the cloud uh, for updating the Gboard model, uh, uh, some local training happens on, on the model. So there's a local model, and that model can be encrypted, which gives the, the green uh, block. Now then, the encrypted model is uploaded to the cloud. Uh, so this gives the collection of, of models under uh, HE wrap, and, uh, and that's in step B. Uh, then uh, these models participate in some kind of model update. Um, so that happens in the cloud, and the result is uh, known as uh, federated uh, aggregation. And the aggregated result is sent um, is C, and that's sent back, distributed to all these phones to update their local models. So in the process, no data travels out, and the local models are protected. Uh, so the cloud does not have knowledge uh, on the local model. Um, the, so that was the to C situation, to consumer situation. In the to business situation, we have like uh, a, maybe a, a retail uh, data set on the left and a bank data set on the right. Um, so the bank is interested in extending the features uh, using the, the red parts. And the retail is interested in getting knowledge on the why, um, so, so, and which it doesn't have. Um, so how do we allow this uh, to happen under security? Um, so the, the first step is to figure out who are the users that are common between the two parties. And this can be done using homomorphic encryption to find out who's common between them without revealing who's not uh, common between the two parties. Uh, and once we find that out, we can engage in some kind of distributed model building uh, to build a local model A and a local model B. Uh, so when combined, these two models form the federated model on top. Uh, so this process happens in these four simple steps. Uh, first, you send the public keys, and then you exchange uh, the intermediate results on each uh, respective um, enterprise, uh, A and B. And uh, you compute the, the gradient and loss using the uh, information from local data and from the other party uh, under encryption. Uh, you update the models and you go back and uh, do the same thing again uh, by exchanging the immediate results step two uh, until until convergence. Okay, so um, um, so so uh, this happens in training, but in inference time, this process can be repeated when new user arrives. Um, you have a process to check if the the, the new user um, uh, satisfy the requirement uh, as well as um, can get the uh, result from party A and party B under encryption and finally combine the result in inference time. Um, so there is a whole proof process that um, the uh, people from the security community are uh, extremely interested in. Um, so we have to prove that if we involve a third party C as a coordinator, uh, the security against um, the party C holds. Um, uh, even though we do not have a coordinator, uh, the information exchange is between A and B. We, we want to make sure that the security against each other holds, and, and all these have to be uh, given positive proofs. Um, Similarly, researchers have uh, extended uh, this federated learning to multitask learning as well uh, by splitting this uh, uh, objective function into multiple parties and figure out how to how they can collectively use a commonly shared knowledge, uh, which they can find out without revealing their private data and parameter to each other. Okay, and. Similarly, this can be done under transfer learning. Uh, when we have one party have 
uh, more data, more, more knowledge, and wish to transfer that knowledge to another party under this encryption. So when the transfer occurs, only the knowledge uh, gets migrated and, and none of the private data goes from A to B. And similarly, it can be done for um, uh, a, a number of questions for inference time, for knowledge transfer to avoid negative transfer between two parties and uh, to show the iteration um, really uh, with iterate really converges. Here I want to mention a few words about differential privacy. Uh, it's a, a very popular technology in the academic world, but unfortunately in industry it hasn't been used as much. And part of the reason is because even though so, so its idea is very simple, um, so you want to in, infuse enough noise so that people cannot tell the difference between the uh, before and after distribution, these two distributions, um, and, and therefore figure out uh, which, uh, which data is, uh, is dif different between, so which individual data can be told by telling the difference between the two distributions. The, the idea is very simple, uh, but it requires introduction of noise. So this has two drawbacks. Number one, um, it requires you to open the, open the data set up to the other party. So the other party can come and query. And this is not allowed uh, in many uh, security situations, many regulations, because it requires data to travel out. And, and secondly, in introducing noise hurts the performance, uh, usually for machine learning. That's a very bad thing. Um, now, the um, federated learning as a whole is a multidisciplinary work. So this requires us to introduce multi-agent technology. In multi-agent, people build economic models to make sure that the multiple parties have incentive to continue to participate in this work. Uh, so for example, the data owner one uh, use a portion of the data to participate in a federated learning model, um, the whole coalition may get some benefit. But then the question may occur when this redistribution of, of the benefit is not fair. And so therefore, data owner one feel uh, shortchanged and therefore want to leave the coalition. So how to prevent that from happening? Uh, this, we can, we can borrow a lot of work from multi-agent systems and economic theory using game theory. Um, so finally, I want to mention some applications of federated learning. And we have, uh, because we work in this uh, uh, startup, this internet bank uh, in China, uh, which has about 200 million users and serving about 100, uh, uh, about uh, 1 million uh, more enterprises. Um, now, um, it uses this uh, partnership model, which works with about 100 other banks. And so they, they pull data together uh, to build anti-money laundering uh, models, anti-fraud models, um, and marketing models, and so on. Um, and usually this co collaboration cannot physically exchange data. So right now, this, uh, they use um, federated learning for anti-money laundering, for risk modeling, for insurance pricing, and for intelligent marketing. Um, so uh, for example, this is the low and medium price uh, uh, size enterprise situation. Um, these companies, because of their small size, they are very risky. They, their cash flow is, is very small. Uh, and so there's not much information unless we look beyond the uh, credit rating. So here, uh, in trans let, let me translate. Some of them are taxation information. Some of them are uh, the uh, uh, legal situation. Uh, some are registration. So all of these, when combined using federated learning, give you a much better picture. And so here's the... Uh, example between WeBank, which is the, the startup I'm working in, working with uh, another code, um, uh, 
a signal, uh, uh, AI signal, which is a, a, a taxation um, information company. Uh, when using federated learning, they give much better performance in, um, in the credit rating. Um, and so the profit increases uh, because you know, uh, fewer bad loans are, are given out. Uh, we are also working with Swiss Re, which is a reinsurance company to build a better insurance model by integrating multiple insurance uh, uh, data from different, different companies, uh, different insurance companies. And in computer vision, uh, this is also a application where a, a city-wide uh, construction sites can be integrated together. Each con construction site is by law is required to install some security camera to, uh, to, uh, to, re to, to give alarms when uh, safety is violated. So for example, if a worker did not wear helmet or if uh, somebody is smoking, the alarm will, will sound. But the automatic alarm system uh, is, needs updated based on more uh, image data. And, and image data from different construction companies that are not shared. Uh, so we use federated learning to link them together and build a uh, updated model for uh, alarm reporting, and, and now it's it's being used in the city of Shenzhen. Um, so in the end, we we hope to build this uh, ecosystem using federated learning. So different parties, uh, including uh, like uh, uh, universities and um, uh, internet companies and, and finance companies can all work together, uh, medical and, and so on. Um, so we are also leading a team of companies in building a IEEE standard uh, for federated learning, as well as working with Linux. Uh, our system is called FATE, uh, Federated uh, Architecture for uh, Technology enabler. Uh, so the whole whole name acronym is FATE, and and it's already uh, on Linux Foundation platform as a open source software. It's the first open source for uh, federated learning. Um, of course, there are uh, federated learning is just starting, uh, so there's a lot of challenges. One challenge is a security challenge. Is what if one party uh, maliciously uh, designs its own data in order to um, to cheat the system and um, to uh, so, so that the federated model is in favor of uh, of this malicious party or uh, can uh, poison the data somewhat in order to uh, second guess other parties' data. So all of these are possible. Uh, currently, there are some solutions against them, but uh, more work are required. Okay, uh, finally, we are uh, publishing a book with uh, Morgan Faithful on federated learning. Uh, it's, it's coming out very soon. Uh, so let me summarize. summarize. So in this talk, I, I, I talked about transfer learning and, and federated learning. So transfer learning is um, for tackling the small data challenge, and federated learning uh, is for tackling the data fragmentation. Challenge and, and all these work are uh, at the beginning stage. Uh, of course, I uh, welcome everybody who join in and contribute. Okay, so that's all. Good for questions. Yes. So, is very learning cities. Can they achieve the same performance as a centralized system? Uh, it's a little lower, yeah. Uh, because of the older approximation and so on. Um, so people are trying to get closer and closer. It depends on a, a balance between security, uh, trade-off between security and performance. Question in terms of how it actually works. You said it sends an encrypted model. That encrypted model, I assume someone can't read it, but you can still apply it? That's right. So it's still yeah. something that can actually be applied. You just can't see what, how it works. Exactly, it right, right. That's the idea. So it's it's like a wrapped package, and so without without uh, 
opening the package, you can you can add uh, that package to the this uh, aggregation. In one of your slides, it had some places at the bottom you didn't mention that it was a semi-honest. Uh, yes. What does that mean? What is semi-honest? <laughs> semi-honest means uh, honest but can be curious. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. So, so not malicious, basically. Not malicious. Not malicious. Not malicious. So it's the normal situation if you work with another party, that party may have one individual who's uh, just curious and speaking to the case. Whereas the issue with unhonest or malicious parties is that somehow they can subvert the system by setting in some kind of malicious exactly. data or something. Exactly. Which is what you're trying to do. Yeah. Which are other. 